There is a place up where the pavement gives way to gravel, well past shopping malls and cell towers, a place I go every year to truly get away. I do a ritual hike to a glacier up there, high above the Lardo Valley and Duncan Lake. It's a slog, about 20 kilometers long and 5,000 feet straight up. But the country, the country is so spectacular. The peaks are named after Shakespeare characters. Mount Banquo, Macduff, and Macbeth. Yeah, the beauty is Shakespearean. About halfway into this grueling hike, you come across a forest. It's one of my favorite parts of my favorite trail. At this spot, the path flattens out and gives way to a towering stand of western red cedar. Trees that started growing centuries before Shakespeare wrote those famous plays. And this ancient forest truly takes my breath away. I'm not the first in my family tree to be drawn to this place or these trees. My great-grandfather, Carlos Lauder, and his brother homesteaded in the Lardo Valley at the turn of the century. They ran one of the first logging companies in the valley and made a living off of these giants, long before feller bunchers and grapplers or even logging trucks, back when sweat, muscle, and hand saws, horses, and paddle wheelers got the wood out. Now... I know what you might be thinking. It's hypocritical to come from a family of loggers, yet profess such a deep appreciation for the very trees they cut down. But I like to think great grandpa Carlos and his brother loved this place as much as I do, and appreciated the trees that put food on the table and sustained our communities. Mining drew the settlers in, but it's the trees that gave them shelter and warmth, and over time, kept generations here in the Columbia Basin. It's the trees that gave us a life. Hi, I'm Mitchell Scott, editor-in-chief of Kootenai Mountain Culture Magazine, and this is The Headwaters, brought to you by Columbia Basin Trust. There are about 744 million trees in the Columbia Basin, give or take 100 million or so. No one has really ever counted them, surprise, surprise, because it's impossible to do. Safe to say, though, we have four to 5,000 trees for every person living in the Kootenays. From spindly little lodgepole pines, which are the most abundant species, to those majestic, towering western red cedar. We are blessed with this incredible natural resource. At times, we're hard on it. It's a wonder tall trees ain't laying down, warbled Neil Young 50 years ago. And that's where we'll begin our podcast. Among the ones most at risk, old growth trees. Jamie Moy spent some time among these giants, and she has a story to tell. So, Jamie... What does old growth even mean? It's one of those terms we hear all the time, but what is an old growth tree? Old growth depends on where you live. It's actually location specific. If you're over in the East Kootenai, which is largely a fire maintained ecosystem, old growth is a tree over 140 years old. But in the West Kootenai, which is mostly temperate rainforest, it's 250 years. And here's something that's a bit confusing. The designation old growth has nothing to do with the size of the tree. See, for me, when I think old growth, I think big, giant, towering tree. Yeah, but here's the thing. You can have a really old tree that's not very big. Like when you're up at high elevation near the tree line and you've got these stubby old trees, barely taller than you and me, that's technically old growth too. Huh. But the trees most people think of when they hear old growth is those giants. Those really wide, really tall, like 50 meter tall trees. Let's call those big tree old growth, just to be specific. I like that term, big tree old growth. Okay, so are our big tree old growth forests in trouble? Yeah, a lot of people who work and play in the bush think so. The province says about 23% of our remaining forest is old growth. So that's about 11 million hectares, which sounds like a lot, but ecologists say that number is misleading 
for the reason I just explained. Not all of those trees are the big giants, the ones that absorb carbon from the atmosphere and reduce the effects of climate change and maintain biodiversity. One panel of scientists pegs that type of old growth forest, the big trees, at a mere fraction of that 23%. How much of a mere fraction? 5%. Ecologists say it's less than 5%, right? Yeah, that's big difference. 23 to 5. How about here in the basin? How do we fare? Not great. Our old growth forests here in the basin have been hit hard. Logging, fire, even the flooding that made way for the reservoirs a half a century ago. We have logged almost all of the best places to grow giant trees, the valley bottoms, at least the ones that are accessible by road. What's left now are these really far-flung forests, like the kind you have to drive to and then hike to for hours to access, or fragments. There's much smaller stands of big trees interspersed here and there, like mm, the John Fenger Trail up near Trout Lake. Or I bet you've probably hiked the one kind of near Nelson, Mitch, right? The old growth trail out by Balfour. I have, and I also love taking my kids. There's one right off the highway near Retallick. It's five incredibly old trees, but that's it. Right, or like that trail up to Island Lake Lodge in Fernie. Heard that's a beauty, too. I would venture that most people who live here have actually never seen an old growth forest. Let's take a walk with Rachel Holt, a biologist who has a PhD in landscape ecology and has studied old growth as much as anyone in the Kootenays. One of my first jobs was to fly around every landscape in the whole Selkirks, looking at the best places to set aside for old growth and we did that for a few years with good integrity and came up with indices of old growth and all kinds of other things, none of which were really implemented. Over her career, Rachel says she has watched old growth systematically disappear in the basin. She worked on that scientific study that found that less than 5% of what I call the big tree old growth forests are left in the province. Naturally, our ecosystems have different amounts of old growth, depending on the natural disturbance regime. In the low elevation ecosystems that are accessible, which is everywhere in every valley bottom throughout the Columbia Basin, there is little to no old growth remaining. How was the clearing of valley bottom old growth even allowed to happen? I mean, it seems like it would be the easiest protect. Well, Rachel says it was allowed because of how we manage our forests. We view trees as potential timber, not as part of a larger ecosystem. The way we have thought about managing the forest has been to focus on timber. So when I say that we have harvested all the old growth, except that that's in parks or in reserves of some kind, that is on purpose. That is the forest management mentality. That is what forest management has been thinking is the right thing to do in British Columbia, uh, to change from a natural landscape to a managed forest landscape That has just been the default action. And, you know, me and many other people for many years have been saying that will fail to maintain our amazing biodiversity. That will fail to maintain hydrology. That will fail to maintain caribou. It will fail to maintain all these other values. But we haven't cared. Are there any significant big tree old growth forests left in the Kootenays? There's a few spots. The Nkamaplu Valley, southeast of Revelstoke. They've got it. Those magical elven forests of towering cedar and hemlock. A thousand, fifteen hundred years old. Yes, exactly. Mostly because it's beyond any road system. There's also some of that big tree old growth north of Revelstoke, like in the Jordan River region. So this tree, this is the whole diameter of the tree. It's 120 centimeters in diameter, and we've got 803 growth rings. We also met with Craig Pettit in New Denver. Craig is a founding member of the Valhalla Wilderness Society. And like Rachel Holt, he's been sounding the alarm about old growth in the basin for decades. And he's been out there in the field, gathering samples from some of the last productive old growth stands to try and put an age on these giants. This is all the tree ring samples I've been doing over the last 20 years. We just knew from going into these forests that these forests were some of the oldest forests I've ever seen. Wherever I go, I preach the message of how old these forests are. 
Valhalla Society has a little five minute video out where I say the four meter tree is probably a seedling at the time that Christ walked the earth. Well, of course, all RPFs are saying, oh, give us a break. Well, this is what I show them. It changes your perspective walking amongst these ancient giants. Imagine a tree that was a seedling, perhaps at the time Christ was born. What has this tree seen? Pettit has lobbied extensively for immediate protection for both the Nkama Plu and the area north of Revelstoke, known as the Frisbee Jordan, which also has the last viable herds of mountain caribou in the Kootenays. And of course, these caribou rely on the old growth forest because that's where the lichen they need to survive flourishes. In the Nkama Plu, there's probably, uh, it's not all old growth, but the intact areas is in excess of 10,000 hectares. The valley bottom is old growth, and as you go up the mountainsides, of course, it gets younger, it's more fire affected, but they're intact valleys. And in Frisbee, Jordan, again, the true old growth is valley bottom and intact, no roads in it. You go into that valley, it's like it's, uh, it, it, it's primeval. It's, it hasn't been altered or changed. This old growth force has to be recognized and it has to be set aside. We cannot log any more of it. Once we cut these trees down, no generation will ever see a 1,000-year-old tree again, let alone a 2,000-year-old tree. 2,000-year-old trees, that's incredible. Are we doing anything differently in British Columbia now to protect old growth yes. forests? been in the news a lot lately. Yeah, we are, especially after the enormity of the Ferry Creek protests on Vancouver Island in 2021. The provincial government just announced over 75 thousand hectares of the Nkamaplu Valley here in the basin will be protected. This is a major victory for Craig and those who have been campaigning for decades to protect that area. Uh, anything else? Yes. The province has a special tree regulation that's been around for a while that can be used to protect individual trees. It's basically a big tree registry where people can nominate trees for protection. It's kind of like adopt a highway, but way cooler because it's for trees. <laughs> exactly. And they're doing it. People are using it. And then more recently, the government removed a clause from the Forest Act that stated that protecting old growth trees, and I'm going to quote this exactly here, Mitch, that protecting old growth trees could not unduly impact timber supply, basically meaning industry would always come before protection. That section has now been taken out, which is a victory for conservation. Wasn't there an old growth report that was yes. produced and part of it yes. originated here in the basin? Yep. Three years ago. The government had asked for an old growth strategic review, and they got a 70-page report called New Futures for Old Forests. I like the title. One of its authors is a longtime Kootenai resident, Gary Merkel. The report lays out 14 recommendations to protect our old growth, here in the basin and beyond. Here's Rachel again. The old growth strategic review process identified a whole bunch of things that we need to do to focus on First Nations and maintaining ecosystem health. We need to just implement those policies. There's lots of talk. We've started to move that way, but we haven't got there because people are scared to shake up the industry. And, and that's the bottom line. The other side of this equation, mill owners and loggers. Just wondering if you talk to any of those guys. Yes. The lumber industry is still the second biggest employer in the Columbia Basin after mining. Do you know, Mitch, there are 7,500 direct jobs in the basin? And the mills are starved for wood and moving many of those jobs south of the border because of a lack of affordable fiber. They need to be part of the conversation. As part of an old growth deferment, the government is doubling a jobs fund to help mills process smaller trees, not just the big stuff. I think mill owners are starting to understand we need to direct volume away from commodity-based dimension lumber into value-added products that create more jobs and are easier on forests. And are we doing that? I think we're getting better at doing that. The new Kolesnikov Mill facility near Castlegar is a great example. So they're the ones making mass timber, which is specialty engineered hardwood products like cross laminated timber, glue lamb beams, a really innovative and much more sustainable way to use wood to build homes. 
office buildings, even high rises. It's definitely not business as usual. Here's Rachel Hold on that. What we need to do is promote the type of mill that Ken Kalesnikov has and radically reduce the actual cut level overall and direct that wood into a value-added industry to maintain existing old growth as much as possible and do restoration of the landscape. I remember being 25 and kind of in a panic about this stuff and people saying, oh, don't worry, they don't log that fast. Well, now it's <laughs> now I'm 55 and it's gone in so many places where it didn't used to be gone. That's just sad. Lots to think about there. But why should we even care if one age class is threatened? We've got those 700 million plus trees in the basin, right? Well, just listen to this next report. It's about one single tree species. This particular tree is called the whitebark pine, and it's almost exclusively at high altitudes. Anyone who's been in the high country will recognize whitebark. It's very distinctive, often gnarly looking, branchy, small to medium sized trees. And this may sound odd, they do look like wise old Gandalf miniature trees, sort of. And they play a crucial role in the entire alpine ecosystem, as Lindsay Clegg tells us. So we're standing here at this white bark pine that's about 16 meters tall. And it definitely a blister rust is its primary uh, stressor in life. Randy Moody peels back the bark of an old-growth pine tree, a white bark pine, which Moody has spent half his life studying, preserving, worrying about. Which begs the question, why? Why worry about a single tree species high up on a mountain? That's a question I get asked a lot. And it's interesting because some people will just care about the tree for its own sake. This tree is declining. Everywhere you look, you find dead white bark pine. And, and so some people care that's enough. But for others, that has incredible wildlife values. Moody is a biologist and president of the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation. Yes, this dying tree has its own foundation. The White Bark Pine is endangered across North America, and it plays a critical role in the entire health of this mountaintop. And Randy Moody has dedicated his life to it. It just a range of ecological roles that this species plays that, that makes this species important to a lot of people. To understand the ecological role the white bark plays, first, we must meet its little buddy, the Clark's Nutcracker. The Clark's Nutcracker has an annoying cackle of a call, but this tiny bird is a real who's who in the hinterland. The Clark's Nutcracker lives in high elevation regions of western North America. A member of the corvid family, which includes ravens and crows, its ash gray feathers are loose in texture. A critical food resource for the Clark's Nutcracker is the seed of the white bark pine. This resourceful little bird has a beak specially designed to crack open pine cones and extract the seed. A single nutcracker stashes up to 100,000 pine seeds in a season for later consumption, mostly in the ground. Often, the Clark's nutcracker forgets where its future meal is stashed. Those forgotten seeds germinate and grow to be new stands of white bark pine. Tree species and bird species could not exist without each other. For more information on the Clark's nutcracker, why not listen to the rest of this podcast? That's so cool. This one bird lives almost solely off white bark pine, and they cooperate for mutual existence. Forgotten seeds become a forest. So virtually every white bark pine you see on the landscape was put there by a forgetful Clark's nutcracker. Randy also tells me other animals live off nutrient-rich white bark seeds, from small rodents to grizzly bears. Next in line is red squirrels. They eat a lot of the cones. They're very nutritious seed. And so they, they eat them to fatten up for, for winter. And then probably the one that people really 
glom onto the most in this region is the grizzly and black bears. Grizzly bears and black bears eat these cones like crazy going into fall when there's a good cone crop. The high elevation white bark pine also holds soil and snow in place in the alpine. It is a critical tree to the entire ecosystem, but it's dying, mostly of an introduced fungus. Called white pine blister rust, and is a fungus introduced just over 100 years ago. And it goes through all the five needle pines, so our western white pine that we have here in BC, as well as limber pine. And it's just slowly working through and killing these trees off. And in some cases, it it stresses them. It doesn't kill them. It stresses them. That makes them vulnerable to other agents, such as mountain pine beetle. Mountain pine beetle is also killing a lot of them off. And then, of course, we have climate change. As the climate warms, these trees are likely going to have to go up in elevation or up in latitude. And there's not much room to go up where we're standing right now. So climate change is a big problem as well. And then there's fire. So here's our sick tree right here. This is a dead one. And then this is our sick tree that's fading off right here. Moody and his foundation trek through the bush all over southern BC, isolating white bark pine and doing whatever they can to save them. Sometimes that means finding the strongest tree in the sickest stand and growing seedlings from them, hoping to develop blister rust resistance, then replanting. He does lots of replanting. Oh boy, how many have I planted? I've probably planted 50,000 of them, Um, which sounds like a lot, but I know to a tree planter that's not that many. But just knowing that you, you got that ball rolling, that you've done something for the future to hopefully... Um, make sure that that wilderness feel is is maintained in some of these areas for future generations and for wildlife and just playing my role in making sure this keystone species stays around. Moody's Foundation isn't the only group fighting to keep white bark alive. Because of its symbiotic relationship with birds, mammals, and the entire forest, the federal government, provinces, U.S. states, and other organizations are also working to save them. One is with the Columbia Basin Trust, working in the basically from Valmont, Golden, to Revelstoke, say, Triangle, the upper and northern Columbia regions. We've been doing a lot of work in there the last two years, which has been really, they're very remote, tough-to-get-to areas, especially the Valemount area. And so we've got this project to plant 100,000 seedlings in five years. The white bark is so endangered that messing with a stand can grow very expensive, as an Alberta ski resort discovered. Lake Louise fined more than $2 million for cutting down endangered trees, but the resort says they are appealing. Now, this works out to $55,000 a tree. I think Lake Louise was a wake-up call to a lot of folks that we need to pay attention to this tree. It's important, and the government is taking it seriously as well, the federal government in particular. It's It's a federally endangered species, so it certainly raised awareness, without a doubt. Moody says people in the forest industry were shocked at the size of the fine. But he says it shows how precious one tree species is. How its loss is a loss to anyone concerned about forests and the animals that live there. White bark only grows in the mountaintops. And when you lose those, you've certainly lost the wild feel because you know that those were put there by a Clark's Nutcracker. You know bears feed on them. And it's a keystone species. It supports so many um, ecological roles in the environment that without those there, it's just not as ecologically rich anymore. Lindsay Clegg with a very cool story about a bird that actually creates forests. Okay, so now it's time we took a walk through one of these forests. We'll stroll along with Terry Nelson from Fernie. Terry was so taken by the forest around his home, he's produced this gorgeous book called Big Trees of the Inland Temperate Rainforest. I've written this book to pay tribute to some of the remaining big trees in BC. People that are reading this book, hopefully they can use it as the guidebook that it's intended to be. They can get out and explore some of the areas that I've been and find their own explorations, perhaps even measure some trees, nominate them to the registry. Terry's book was five years in the making. And there's beautiful shots of trees from the Robson Valley all the way down to the U.S. border south of his home. We're going to leave him with the final word. I did a lot of research when I first set out on this big tree journey. 
a lot of the information I gathered at the start was from the BC Big Tree Registry. And I was very curious about what other big trees were in the East Kootenai area around Fernie where I live. So I started looking around uh, some of the ones that were noted in the registry, examples being the Big Tree Ponderosa in Cranbrook or the Hell Roaring Creek Larch near Kimberley. I went and checked out some big Douglas firs up around Elkford. And then I started looking closer to home and got into some areas where maybe some trees hadn't been documented and discovered some of the tallest larch trees in BC, the largest subalpine fir in the province growing up on the ski hill. And I thought, well, I better kind of start looking a bit further afield. I often get asked, you know, what is it about big trees that I find so interesting? And I, I think it's just that the humbling that occurs when the human form is diminished in the presence of sort of a large and old living entity. You know, when you're out big tree seeking, you know, you end up in a lot of areas that are otherwise unexplored, getting off trail, bushwhacking through heavy underbrush, and then coming upon a great big sentinel that's holding its own in the forest. This is probably one of the most satisfying moments. That's our podcast, brought to you by Columbia Basin Trust. For more information on all the incredible work the Trust does, go to OurTrust.org. You can find related stories, photos, and art on our website, HeadwatersPodcast.com. Peter Moynes, my business partner at Cooney Mountain Culture Magazine, finds and at times shoots these photos for us. We thank Peter for his work on the headwaters, and we thank you for listening. I'm Mitchell Scott.